I want to thank Sean Sander, who is our fabulous host tonight. I want to thank all of you for uh, being on the call, being on the class. Um, I want to, I've got a whole outline of content that will talk about uh, Leonard Cohen and the Sinai in 1973 okay. and what it might mean for Israel today in light of the election news. But first, before we do, and I'll go over the outline of the content, I'd love to start by hearing your voices. Uh, what did you think of this book? Um, and I would love to hear just some, a quick popcorn on, I love the book, I didn't love the book, I like the book, and, and why. So if you're open to sharing a real quick, like what you thought about the book first, so we could hear your voices, then I'm delighted to ask Sean to show the outline and, and then get into the content. Uh, but anyone want to share some initial reactions to the book? This is kind of like a big book group, uh, a temple book group. So we, we, we always start that by saying, what do you think of the book? So anyone want to share? Anyone like the book a lot? I'd be glad to speak if you would let me. Uh, yeah, please. Who's that? Joni Katz. Okay. Joni always loved your voice. Yeah, what do you think of the book? Thank you. Um, I'm glad you suggested it because I, I this is the second book that I, I actually heard Maddie Friedman speak speak about about um, five years ago. He's a very good writer. And I like the sensitivity to the Sinai campaign and what the soldiers were actually feeling how interwove the stories of the, of the the fear that the people had actually being in the Sinai during that time and not knowing what was going to happen to Israel. So that was a clever thing. And I really got to know the complexity of um, Cohen. He was never my favorite. I never disliked him. But I could see that I, I applauded his effort to have gone there, not knowing what else to do when he was in Greece. So wow. I, it, it, yeah. Thank you, Jenna. So in other words, so you like that it kind of captured what it was like to be an Israeli soldier in 1973, particularly in the first 10 days of the war when it was really scary. And it also captured, you know, Cohn's personal journey and, and the interplay between the two, the personal and the national story. Thank you, Joni. Anyone else want to just jump in? with some initial reactions to the book. Uh, you can raise your hand or show the hand on the screen if you if you do. Okay. Um, Sean, I'm, oh, is that Bruce? Bruce Donna. Oh, is that Bruce? Bruce Donna. We just happened to discuss this at our book group only last night. It was uh, very interesting. And um, I think, uh, it reminded me that I had an Israeli resident with me back in 1973. And when this war broke out, he was gone within an hour. Mm -hmm. He went wow. home. Wow. wow, wow, thank you, Bruce. Uh, Paul Greenberg, love your voice. Sure, thank you. So I've always wondered whenever I saw the antenna took of prayer, why Cohen started his, his poem or his song in the middle of that prayer. Right. I, I never quite quite understood what was so important to him of Who by Fire until I read this book. And now I finally understand that it was written or it was conceived of by Cohen in the context of a war. And Who by Fire was not necessarily the fire you light with a match, but perhaps it was Who by Enemy Fire or even by that very unfortunate story that Matty Friedman told at the beginning wow. of Who by Friendly Fire. Wow. Thank you, Paul. You know, who by fire, right? And who we, we it, it's usually juxtaposed against who by fire, who by water. So you think about, you know, the fire of the Sodom and Gomorrah versus the water of the flood in the Noah story, but this is enemy fire or friendly fire. Thank you, Paul, really interesting. Jonathan Dalitsky, can we see your beautiful face, Jonathan? Uh, sure, here I am. Um, so I actually read it some while ago. I heard an interview with Matty Friedman on, I think it was one of the Hartman podcasts uh, about three months ago. And I you know, got the book as soon as I could after that. Um, it really spoke to me very intensely. I've, I've been a tremendous fan of Leonard Cohen since his first album came back, out back in, in the 60s. Um, and, um, the, you know, the, the sense of his Jewish identity being so intertwined with his with his body um, that he had to go even though he wasn't at that stage of his life observant he was living in Hydra he was living a very secular life and yet he had to go um, and it was this incredibly intense experience that he had 
resulted in some amazing songs, resulted in this really moving experience for everybody who was with him. And yet he never spoke about it again afterwards or wrote about it again. And I'm, you know, Maddie writes about this, but I remain totally puzzled about how he totally um, internalized it and, 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 and it never came out again. Although I think there are shards of it that show up in some of the later songs. Right. I think right. we could talk about that maybe. Yeah, and we will, when we will. Thank you, hon. We'll take one last framing intro comment uh, from David Rosenson, and then I'm gonna introduce kind of the content for the night about the book. David. I was, uh... I was in the Israeli army in 73 um, and uh, was not on the front lines. I was in a unit uh, behind the lines supporting the units in Sinai. And uh, one thing in the book that really struck me was that uh, Cohen was uh, impressed, was drawn to the fact that nobody was thinking of themselves, that everybody was co cooperating everybody was acting selflessly um that that how unfortunate it is that war seems to draw out our best qualities hmm. but that's what it takes and and that was my experience there was uh always a lot of groaning and complaints among soldiers uh constant and the moment the war started, all of that ceased entirely. Wow. And the moment there was a ceasefire, it all came back. <laughs> wow. That's just the way people are. Wow. Well, David, uh, thank you. And Jonathan and Paul and Bruce and Joni, thank you for some initial framing comments. Um, before I show you the screen, um, I want to just kind of frame the, the class at, at, a, at a higher level. When we came up with this date, November 3rd, to talk about the book, of course, we did not know, I certainly did not know about the Israeli elections and, and what that would mean for us. Um, but it's actually, I, I feel like it's a deep blessing that I'm here with you, that we're here together tonight. It's a deep blessing because um, it's, it's, I think it's going to be a really helpful space to talk about something that's extremely, extremely, I think, concerning is not a strong enough word. I think alarming is, is a better word. Um, let me, this is how I feel. Um, and and uh, this is gonna be my framing. You know, the book provides ironically a very helpful parallel for us now. Cause what the book is about, Israel's physical survival was at stake. Israel's physical survival was at stake and a non, Israeli, a Canadian Jew living in Hydra comes and, and goes to Israel and has this experience. And I feel that now Israel's moral survival and spiritual survival and Jewish values survival is at stake. The notion that a guy that Israel itself shunned, the Israeli defense forces would not allow Ben Gavir to serve. Israeli courts prosecuted him and prosecutors prosecuted him and courts convicted him for terrorism. He did stuff that is just clearly beyond, uh, over the line. Having a Bora Goldstein portrait in your home is over the line. Uh, saying Mayor Kahana is your hero is over the line. And the notion, and I was there, I was there last week and I saw, you know, I saw energy for him, people jumping up and down and chanting his name. And the notion that they would be chanting, and chanting his name, I was truly terrified when I learned who he was and what he represented and the fact that he has gone from Goliath to Kingmaker. That is new. I got, you know, I listened to the email. It's funny to say, oh, this is the thing, this is 30 years. Who bless? Three years. And bless, I'm sorry, we're having a little uh, trouble with your mic. Would you be able to just mute and unmute really quick? Yeah, sure, sorry. Can you hear me now? No. Let me let me leave and I'll rejoin. You sound very hoarse. Yes, I could hear you, but you sound hoarse. Yeah, I apologize, everyone. Just a, a brief technology technology issue. I'm sure it should be fixed once Wes comes back. Can we talk about it while he's gone. Go for it. We would love that. 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? No. You're can, on. If everyone else can be on uh, muted, uh, Sean, can you hear me now? Yes, that's perfect, Wes. Okay, good. So I was saying that there's a, a parallel between uh, Israel's physical uh, threat that um, Leonard Cohen came to in 1973 and the uh, values threat, moral threat, Jewish values threat that Israel is in today, and the idea that this guy, Ben Gavir, that Israeli society and Israeli establishment itself rejected, he was a pariah, and now he's a kingmaker, this should cause all of us fear and trembling. He had Boruch Goldstein portrayed in his home. The fact that he's the kingmaker, fear and trembling. This is, and, by, and that's just for us and for the Jewish state, let alone the issue of how you're going to communicate this to your children and grandchildren who are on college campuses. Um, so it's a serious heart attack. It's a serious problem. Um, so what I want to do is mine the story of Leonard Cohn in the Sinai for what it could teach us about Israel today in this values crisis. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. So, Sean, if you can show the first page, which is the outline, I want to, I kind of identified four themes. And I'm going to run through the themes real quick, like, and then we'll look at the story. And for each of these themes, we want to look at the text in the book and see how the theme played out for Leonard Cohn in the 73 war. And what does it teach us about his story in Israel in 73? And then what does it teach us about Israel today? Okay, so these are the themes. The first is the crazy story that he did not go to Israel to sing. He went to Israel, he thought, you know, he didn't really know why he went to Israel. Maybe he'll go to a kibbutz so somebody, uh, one of the kibbutz workers can, can uh, serve. Um, and it was uh, that chance encounter at a cafe in Tel Aviv that, resulted in his singing. He did not even bring a guitar. The Israeli military during the war had to bring him a guitar. And I want to just double click on that. Just the, the ran and, and, and you think about the noun that you would use to explain it. God, karma, providence, luck, randomness, who knows. But I want to just talk about that in the context of the story. And then talk about, to me, it's about mystery and it's about humility. And I'm wondering how that theme plays into Israel today. Second, which is complexity. And Jonathan Deltitsky had talked about some of his songs and his music. I want to talk about Lover, 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 which, as you know from the book, he came up with the first day he was at the army base in Hatzor in the Sinai. After the first show and then before the second show, he came up with it. And as you know um, from the book, if you've read it, that there was a stanza which he sang at the army base, um, identifying with Israeli soldiers and calling them his brother. But then when, he, uh, when the war was over, that stanza disappeared. And in fact, um, Matty Friedman talks to soldiers who heard that song with the stanza, where Leonard Cohen called them my brothers, and now they hear it without that stanza, and it causes some feelings and complexity. And more to the point, when Leonard Cohen sings in universal crowds, when he's not a Jew speaking to Jewish soldiers, when he's a poet and a singer speaking to mixed crowds, he says he sang it for Egyptians and Israelis in that order, Egyptians and Israelis. So I, I want to talk about how we process that and this whole issue of complexity and how that connects with this story. Third, um, and, and this was pretty, I found this so simple and helpful. He goes there with depression and Leonard Cohen, and we'll look at the text, but Leonard Cohen talks about that he struggled with depression throughout his life. And he just has this very simple statement, I came to raise their spirits and they raised mine. That his best move and most effective move at responding to ameliorating his depression was, was not Canyon Ranch, uh, not Aspen, and, and not even therapy, although I'm a huge supporter of Canyon Ranch, Aspen, and therapy, but 
but being in these dusty air force bases with soldiers who were you know off to battle and who knew if they would come back that was what lifted his depression and what does that tell us now about life and what does that tell us now about israel and then finally as you know uh the he took his kohen uh function seriously blessing israel he took seriously the book ends with him you know putting his hands in the form of a kohen and blessing uh, blessing Israel through the, the priestly blessing, from the book of Numbers. And, and I want to talk about how, and so here, I want to talk about how do we bless Israel now with all of this complexity and alarm about a nativist, racist hater who Israel itself had put as a pariah who's now a kingmaker, going to be given a big post in the government. How do we bless Israel in the face of that? And uh, so those are our four, four topics. So with that, um, let's jump into the first one. Sean, can you show page one? I just want to read real quick like this, just so that we're all literally reading from the same page. Um, how does it turn out? That, like, what's the the problem for this whole story? crazy story of Leonard Cohen singing to soldiers and it wasn't it wasn't premeditated right so it's uh he 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 goes to Tel Aviv and he's sitting in Cafe Panati and and then I'll start reading from the bottom of the page in Rovina's account of the meeting at the cafe Oshik who's another singer returned to her and said the guy sitting over there by himself looks like Leonard Cohen you wish she replied page two please Oshik said, I'm serious, it's Leonard Cohn, and went over to prove her wrong. We invited him to sit with us, Ravina remembered. We said we were singers and asked what he was doing in Israel. He said, I heard there's a war, so I came to volunteer for harvest work on the kibbutzim and release a few guys to fight. We told him there was no harvest right now, suggested he come play, uh, play concerts with us. He said he was a pacifist. And then go down to one last page, uh, the page three. Story ends, after the musicians left the cafe, one of them made a call to an Air Force officer. The Air Force officer was hemorrhaging planes and pilots at a rate so shocking, it was being hidden from the public. But someone there still found time to get a guitar for Leonard Cohn. None of the artists had any idea how bad things were, what they were getting themselves into. Cohn climbed into the Ford Falcon and went off to find the war. Thank you, Sean, we'll take the full screen back. So I want to just first, let's talk about this in the context of, of, of Leonard Cohen, what, what the rabbis would call Peshat, this story in its own context. How do, you, how, like, how do you react to that? Like he doesn't come with a guitar and he doesn't come with a plan and he doesn't come with an itinerary. He comes with no guitar, no plan, no itinerary. And it is by chance that he happens to be sitting in a cafe when Israeli singers happen to walk by and they get him a guitar from the army in the middle of the war. Uh, what, what, how do you understand that? Any, any takers? Uh, anybody want to comment and, and uh, use your hand function? That way I can call on you or you can let uh, Sean know. Uh, so Avi, please. Yeah, Avi. I was in the Air Force. And we saw him performing in the, during the war. You saw him. You heard him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell us more. Yeah, I was a young Canadian guy with long hair, uh, look a little bit like a hippie, and his songs were touching. But the most important thing, despite the harsh time, we felt we are not alone. Mm. So beyond the singing, I felt it was the moral support. He came, he performed a good number of Air Force bases that shut him. I saw him, I think it was in Hatserim, which is near Beersheba in the South. He came and it was very touching for everybody because everybody was demoralized. The war was not going well the first 10 days. So his appearance was like magic. Wow, well, Avi, thank you for that. First person eyewitness account, oh my God. 
we're so blessed to have you tonight. Could you tell us anything more? Like, what do you remember, you know, 50 years later about, about that moment? I mean, you remember that he was present, that it felt hopeful, uh, helpful that he was here, not alone. Anything else you remember about the singing or anything else? Honestly, I don't remember any specifics of the songs. Okay, right. Our mind was someplace else, as you can imagine. Yes. And very few of us stay to the whole performance because you are called in and out, you know, it depends on the mission. Planes are coming and going. And with many other worries. And one of the big questions you are sending out a formation of four, are all the four coming back, or only two or three? Wow. You know, people are just falling apart. And it's very hard. It was Zubin Mehta who came to perform with the Philharmonic, uh, Leonard Cohen and a few others, not many. Mm -hmm. But these are people I never forget. They, they, they took the courage to go into the war zone yeah. and to help the brothers. Wow. Avi, thank you. What I take away from what you just said is that what people remember 50 years later is, is not the content, but the contact. Not, a kavana, not, the lyric, a kavana. not the lyrics, but the fact that they came, that they cared, that they showed up. They remember that they showed up for you. A kavana, the meaning, the kavana. The kavana, yeah. Svi, uh, Svi, Svi or Rosita. Yes. So when Rosita told me that she wrote you, that I met him in the war, I went to my book about the picture of Yom Kippur War, and I saw that I wrote that. I have a picture with him. I was in a unit surrounded the Third Army, and I was officer over there. And uh, when the unit of, you know, the uh, singer and arrived to our unit, we have a a routine to show them in case the Israel, the Egyptians start shooting at us and artillery, where we move them to a shelter. So the first thing he showed up, he showed up with Mati Kaspi, which is another famous singer and another one, they had the guitar and we show him what happened if there is an artillery, where he's going. And sure enough, 45 minutes, uh, it was the first uh, sea fire when with the Egyptians surrounding the army. And 45 minutes after, uh, there was an alert. So we brought him to the shelter. We asked him to stay there overnight. And he was very nervous at the beginning, but he was very, uh, later on he came down and he was very interested about the soldier. What do you eat? Where do you sleep? What do you do? And uh, we left him alone with his unit, but I have a picture with him. And uh, in Israel, he was very famous in our teenage, and my soldier asked him, sing Suzanne, sing all those famous songs. And it was unbelievable, cheering us up. Wow, so I, so I, thank you Tzvi, thank you Avi for your first person testimony. I mean, that's just stunning. Here's my question to the group, which is how do you assess the fact that that, that kind of encounter that they remember 50 years later, times all the soldiers and, and fighters that he saw and, and Air Force pilots, et cetera, um, army personnel that he saw, all came about as a result of a chance encounter at the cafe in, uh, in Tel Aviv. Is anyone, does anyone else find that noteworthy? Uh, it, it noteworthy. In other words, like how is it that a life evolves or develops um, and that such a meaningful encounter that is for him, the three weeks that he was there and for the soldiers who remember it 50 years later was not part of a plan. It, there was just a randomness to it. And I'm wondering if anyone wants to comment on the meaning of that. Uh, please, Joel. So I was in Israel mid-September and Modi Friedman actually did a program uh, in Jerusalem on this. And what he, he had said was that um, uh, Leonard Cohen's life was, he was on a Greek island. It wasn't going well. He had a relationship that my impression was not going well at all. Matter of fact, he was considering giving up entertaining. He, he just, you know, th things weren't going well for him. 
and I think you said or he had been dealing with depression for quite some time. And for some reason, when this war broke out, it's uh, that sort of thing is such a vivid experience. He just felt he needed to be there. And he went and then serendipity. I mean, I met my wife, Mazelle, who's born in Calcutta, India, in Cleveland, Ohio, because of a snowstorm. So I believe in predestination. And I am sure almost everybody in this call has something that happened in their life that can't be explained rationally. So I think those events happen to all of us, Wes. Okay, Joel. So here's my question now. I want to shift from Leonard Cohen in 73, running into Alana Rovina and having the experience he did. Um, how does this theme of mystery, of humility, of randomness, of that which we cannot explain, how does that intersect with Israel today uh, in the face of the of Ben Gavir? going from pariah to kingmaker. Do you see any, is there any learning or wisdom from this that that can give us some insight? Anybody? Uh, Bob Weinstein. And if you can unmute, please, Bob. Didn't Begin go from pariah to prime minister? From terrorist to prime minister? Uh, yeah, but there, I mean, he did. As, actually, there was a, a, a movie about Begin's uh, life that was shown um, a, a couple Sunday nights ago. But, and we don't want to, I don't want to get hijacked by this, but, but obviously very different, uh, very different. And Begin was, uh, in the end, of course, uh, a, a peace, he made peace with Sadat, it came David. So perhaps that suggests, and perhaps that suggests that if you are losing sleep about the election, as I am, and if you are worrying that Israel just elected a terrorist with uh, who, who sees Barack Goldstein as his hero, which it just did, that we leave some room, some room for mystery and how events might play play out. Uh, better than we fear. Um, I'll, I guess I'll leave it. I'll leave it with that. I wanna, I wanna pivot to the theme of complexity, because um, Sean, I'm gonna ask you to turn to page four. Um, one of the really powerful parts of the story is Leonard Cohn singing "Lover, Lover, Lover," you know, "Come Back to Me," and remember it in. In, at this point in the war, Russia had supplied the Egyptian military with these SAMs that that found Israeli airplanes and destroyed Israeli airplanes and killed the pilots in those Israeli airplanes. And and again, just this is just saying what you all know, but it's worth saying that in '67, uh, Egypt had no answer for our military. And six years later, they had a fatal answer to our airplanes, Air Force. And as a result, uh, it was super dangerous. And a lot of these pilots, Hatsor was an Air Force base. So pilots were going onto planes and they knew of these SAMs and they did not know would they come home, right? So in any case, the singer wished them well as they flew out to face the SAMs. And in subsequent versions, the song became a kind of talisman. May the spirit of this song, may it rise up pure and free. May it shield, be a shield for you, a shield against the enemy. And then he says, bottom hand of that paragraph, um, one of the duties of a priest, a Kohen, uh, in Judaism is to stand in front of the congregation and call down divine uh, protection. May God bless and guard you. Invoking that shield is what a Kohen does. And Cohn took that seriously, okay? So when he's in Chatzor, he is praying for Israeli soldiers. Um, can you go, Ashan, please, to page five? And then on page five, you actually see him um, performing uh, to these uh, soldiers. And um, I'll just read for a second in the middle of the, of the page. Oprah Amos, a Skyhawk pilot, never forgot the mood of the show. 
the experience as I remember it was forgetting everything and going to another world, one that wasn't all of us racing around and the dead people and the fear. I recall it as a formative event, one of the world's greatest singers coming in the middle of the war amid all the chaos, bringing us some quiet and the sound of something else. And, um, and this, this chapter ends in such a haunting way. In the photograph, Amos can be seen in a striped shirt sitting on the far left. Ofer is in the center in a light colored shirt, arms straight over his knee. Behind him and to the left, looking intently at the performers with a half smile is Momo, who on his first mission saw the base commander fly into the waves and disappear. Okay, so he was singing the people who didn't know which of them were going to come back. And just that, that level of intensity. And so he was praying for protection. And then, Sean, turn to page six, if you will. Okay. And this is just so interesting, um, the missing last stanza. So um, as you know, Marty Friedman found this manuscript, uh, 45 pages that was otherwise not known and that he had permission to uh, publish. And in the manuscript confirms what Israeli soldiers like Svi and Avi on our call remember contemporaneously, which was there was a chapter where he called us his brothers. He called us his brothers. I went down to the desert to help my brothers fight. I knew they weren't wrong. I knew they were right, but bones must stand up straight and walk and blood must move around. Men go making ugly lines across the holy ground. And then that version is lost. He, he drops it. And already shortly thereafter, he started toning it down. And then, um, uh, Sean, if you could turn to page seven. So, uh, Marty Friedman talks to a soldier who, who remembers it. Okay, so um, a year or two later, after Lover, Lover, Lover was released, with, that is without that stanza, the, You're My Brothers, Shlomi heard it on the radio, um, but the bastard changed the words. The part identifying with the Israelis was gone. And then this guy, the soldier who had heard it 50 years ago, he's always wanted to know why those lines were erased, he said. The change doesn't make him angry, just sad. He wants to love Leonard Cohn, and this interferes. And then, Sean, if you go to page eight. And then, th and this is the last piece of this complexity. Um, that's why it hurt when Cohn pulled back. The man Leonard Cohen was on the Israeli side and the song was written at an Israeli base. But the poet Leonard Cohen thought his words had to be bigger than the Israelis and bigger than the war. Later when Cohen performed Lover, Lover, Lover on stage, he'd acknowledge where he wrote the song. But he would tell the audience it was for the soldiers on both sides. At one concert in France, he even claimed to have written it for the Egyptians and the Israelis in that order. So uh, Sean, I'll come back to the full screen, please. So this is so interesting, just the complexity. He writes it for Israeli soldiers. He calls them his brothers. And then after the war, he takes that stanza out. And he says, it's, it's about protection of all soldiers. And I wrote it for the Egyptians and the Israelis. Um, how do you guys respond to that kind of complexity? Uh, Bill Greenberg. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> he's a complicated guy yes. and uh, uh, not an altogether uh, admirable or likable guy. And uh, for those who read the book, you know how he treats his, I, I, was it his wife that he was in Greece with or a yeah. longtime paramour? Uh, he treats her shabbily. Uh, uh, he is uh, quite mean-spirited. And he's uh, self-absorbed. So the fact that his he makes changes in his songs and is not loyal to the origin of the song should not come as a surprise. That's what I would say to that. May I comment on some of the earlier questions or would you prefer not? No, please, I would love your comments. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, uh, uh, I, I'm not at all impressed by the fact that he goes to uh, work uh, in Israel and ends up on the front. Things happen. Uh, unlike Joel, I don't think they're preordained. 
I think there's a, a randomness and uh, it's not altogether uh, wild that it happened. We hear that he gave two other concerts in Israel that were quite uh, the scenes a, a year or two earlier. So he was not only known on the radio, but he uh, uh, he'd already established a tie to Israel, so people recognize him. I'm not uh, impressed by that. The more important question you raise is uh, how do we understand the rise of this uh, terrorist and the prominence of this terrorist? And uh, I, I think there are very good reasons for it. And uh, one, there are international reasons for it. There is a rise of the right throughout. Within Israel, there are very good reasons for it. Uh, the rise of the right in Israel, the fueling of uh, hateful language historically by Netanyahu, you know, the infamous campaign in which uh, Netanyahu tolerated those dreadful comments about Rabin soon, soon before his murder. So uh, there are good reasons. This, this doesn't come out of uh, nowhere. And, uh, and similarly, I don't think it'll go away by chance. I think it'll go away by very careful attention, very thoughtful attention to people like those on this call. Uh, and uh, people who were distressed like we are uh, over time. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Um, so uh, yes to, to, to all that you say. Um, any other ideas or insights just about, I remember uh, Danny Gordis's first book about Israel is, uh, you know, if a land can make you cry. And if I were to write that, uh, my version of that book based on Israel that I know and love, it's if a land can just present you with literally infinite complexity. Um, and, um, and, and, then, and this notion of complexity, I'm wondering, you know, I, I see that in, in the way that he, that he identified here with Israel, you're my brothers and the afterwards not, that it's just a land where multiple truths uh, can be free. Those of us who have been, uh, mm -hmm. at, in Israel at Hartman might remember um, the evening. Did, I mean, I'll never forget this. It was when the three young soldiers were, or three young kids at, at the Goosh were kidnapped and and then we didn't know where they were. And, and then like one night um, it was revealed that they had died and there were funerals and the land was just crying that day for funerals of young people who were kidnapped. And that night we were at Hartman and there was a jazz, you could hear the sounds of jazz um, that uh, the, in the day they buried these soldier, these, these young students who were not soldiers who were kidnapped. And then at night they played jazz that you could hear on the streets of Jerusalem. Um, and there is just something about this land that promotes complexity. And I'm wondering, let me just pivot now to the theme of Ben Gavir and Israel Today, Avi Seidman. And if, yeah, if you can unmute, please, Avi. There's one element that may explain part of the Ben Gavir phenomenon, maybe a small part, but I think it's important to understand. In Israel, a large majority are secular. They are the so called orthodox parties. Two of them are in the parliament now, two and a half in effect. Yeah, it's just Faradim with Shas and the two other, Yaduta Torah, etc. The kind of the very orthodox. And there used to be another party until 10, 15 years ago called Mafdal, which was the national uh, religious party. And it was pretty much Kipot Surugot, uh, soft orthodox what we will call today in the US the modern orthodox. And they were kind of, they were originated by a movement called Mizrahi before World War II. These were the orthodox Zionists who wanted to, like many others, become farmers and made Aliyah before the disaster of World War II, mostly from uh, Eastern Europe. 
this party died over the years. The Sephardim went to other parties, to Shas, etc. And then radicalization took place. Naftali Bennett and Shaked, like four or five years ago, tried to revive it with some success. At one point, they had like 15 seats and then start declining quickly. And it turns out that those individuals who would have been the natural voters for this Mizrahi party or the uh, National Orthodox, I call it the Soft Orthodox Party, had no home. And Ben Gavi, in a way, grabbed it as their home because they did not feel like joining the super Orthodox party mm. and they didn't want to join a secular party. So somehow he grabbed this empty space and took it over, even though he had his own very nationalistic and radical religion. But that may explain part of the shift that is taking place in Israeli politics. Avi, thank you. Thank you for that explanation of, uh, of political complexity. We'll just take two last comments on this point of complexity, and then I want to move to, to depression and anxiety, which are big themes in, in the book and in life. Um, Steve Bookbinder, next to last comment on complexity. Yeah, the, the point about earlier about uh, Leonard Cohen being, you know, the, the spontaneity, the coincidence in Tel Aviv, versus Ben Gavir, I think is important to note that Ben Gavir doesn't suddenly spring up. There's Bitzalel Smotrich, who five years ago said, I'm a proud homophobe. There's Yishai Schliesel, who in 2005 wounds six people at the Jerusalem gay parade. And 10 years later, after many demands for his release, three weeks after his release in 2015, murders a 15 year old girl at the gay pride parade and seriously cripples two others. So Smotrich and Gavir are really have inherited this sort of strange streak that we have to come to get grips with of bigotry of uh, against Arabs, against gay people, um, and covering it with some sort of religious explanation for all of that. Um, and Baruch Goldstein, for whom there is still a monument in Hebron, you know, this is all part of a much larger, much longer development um, that is, to me, pretty confusing and I don't know where it ends because they were originally thought of as being, you know, just offshoots of something that it wouldn't grow into anything, but that cancer has grown. So how we deal with that cancer as American Jews, uh, as conservative Jews and reform Jews who are ridiculed by these same people, um, to me is a very serious question. Yeah. I mean, Steve. Yes, if you if you read that the Times article that I, I included in the teaser, yeah, uh, the the complexity of Ben Gavir to me is that he was himself spurned and repudiated Absolutely. by the Israeli authority. Like all the most important institutions in Israel said no to Ben Gavir. The IDF said no to Ben Gavir. Prosecutors prosecuted Ben Gavir. Courts convicted Ben Gavir, and now Ben Gavir is a kingmaker. And that complexity, uh, by the way, uh, FYI, just want to drop a footnote for something that's really worth your time. The Ezra Klein Show podcast, the Ezra Klein Show, uh, the most recent one has this really thoughtful conversation about e explaining the phenomenon of right wing ascendancy throughout the world. Um, and it's uh, it's not just in America, and they don't even really talk about Israel. They talk about all the other places, but just it's just something to note if you want to try to understand what's happening in Israel and you know in our own country, uh, in the broader canvas of the world. Uh, Ezra Klein has a really good show. It's it's the latest uh, podcast. Thank you, Steve. Last comment on the issue of complexity uh, before we get to depression. Uh, David Rosenson. 
there's there's a very important development in Israel that we haven't mentioned that explains it's one of the reasons why Ben Gvir is is getting more votes, and that is that there is a low level intifada going on, that people are being attacked uh, on the streets with with cars, with knives, with guns, almost every day. People feel insecure there. Uh, and uh, I, I think what you can everyone else uh, mute or Sean, can you please mute everyone else, please? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's 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 extremely unfortunate that it ends up, uh, get, you know, drawing support for people like Benvir, but people feel insecure, and when they feel insecure, they're looking for. Uh, some are looking for easy answers. Uh, some are becoming hateful, and you know, my my cousin uh, uh, for, uh, just visited from Israel, and he's. As as liberal as as they come, and he said he's lately he's been feeling insecure. Um, that has a that's a very important component of what's going on. Wow. This is there are enemies of peace uh, on the Arab side that are organizing these attacks that are uh, you know keeping the pressure on through these attacks, and knowing that it will create pressure for right-wing responses with the point of, of exacerbating mm -hmm. the conflict. David, thank you, yeah, for adding yet another layer of complexity. Like, and that, that I, I, I didn't realize that connection. And, you know, you, you asked the question, how could it be that a Jewish state that had spurned this hater would now elect this hater? Uh, that's yet one more level of complexity. Uh, and insight. Um, so I want to pivot now to how this makes me feel, and uh, which is depressed. I feel really depressed about Israel. I, and I was in Israel last week, and I, I, I shared that in the teaser. I didn't even know who Ben Gavir was because, you know, I, I don't follow Israeli politics that closely. And, uh, and when, and I saw all this energy jumping up and down. Uh, young people, uh, males, uh, Haredis, uh, with Kippot and Sitzis, et cetera. And they're jumping up and down for Ben Gavir, Ben Gavir. And then when I found out Ben Gavir, oh my God. And, and I've, I've been depressed since then. Depressed and anxious. And my question is, what, what does one do with depression and anxiety? And how do you get out of depression and anxiety. And by the way, we haven't even talked about how what happened in Israel on Tuesday is likely going to foreshadow what's going to happen in America on Tuesday, right? If, yeah, if what happened in Israel on Tuesday is likely going to foreshadow what's going to happen in America on Tuesday. So, so I've been struggling with this issue of how does, what does one do with depression? Um, so I wanted to turn, Sean, if you can turn to page nine, nine for now. I, I found this, this piece of the book singularly powerful and helpful to me. So I wanted to share it with you. And I, and, and I know that we have some, some therapists and mental health professionals on the call, but I'm on the bottom of the first column of page nine. Cohn was stalked by depression for much of his life. And the months on Hydra before the war seemed to have been dark. I live here with a woman and a child, he wrote. The situation makes me kind of nervous. An island is a place to escape too, but also a place where you're stranded. The mood is expressed in his written account of the journey to Sinai, the beginning of which appears in the next chapter. The writing is livid and obscene. The way he writes about women, the way he related to them was part of the style of those days, but it's out of step with our own times. It might come as a shock to those unfamiliar with his earlier poetry and novels who knew his transcendent hits without knowing what he was transcending, or these memories of the man came from his last incarnation as a gentleman in a suit. This later version of Cohn uh, quipped that the first time he really met a woman was when he was 65, but the poet at 39, the one who traveled to Sinai and used to, to type this manuscript, is in the grip of anger and urges. He's trying to lose himself with women and drugs. He's a harder character to love, right? So um, 
he's and he also, by the way, goes on to say that he's creatively stymied. He feels like he should quit. Um, so he's unlikable. You know, he's not loyal to the mother of his son. He's with women, with the drugs. Uh, he's not likable. Um, and now turn to page 10, if you would, uh, please, Sean. Um, and, and a lot of his songs are melancholy. So I was afraid at first that my quiet and melancholy songs weren't the kind that would encourage soldiers on the front. Um, but I learned that these wonderful kids don't need glorious battle anthems. Now between battles, they're open to my songs maybe more than ever before. I came to raise their spirits and they raised mine. Thank you, Sean, if we can come back to the full screen. Um, this notion of a guy who's running away from his life, he's escaping his life. You know, he's not running to, based on Friedman's read of Cohn's 45 page manuscript. He's not a passionate Zionist saying, oh, I have to be there for the Jewish people in a time of war. He's a hot mess and he's running away from his own life. And, and he goes there and in the process of singing to these soldiers, he finds his voice. I went there to raise their spirits and they raised mine. What do you guys think of that simple, elegant um, algorithm for one effective way to deal with depression? which is do something for somebody else. And what's the resonance of that and in, in life, in our own life, um, and you know, getting out of our own head and getting out of our own sorrow and doing something for somebody else raises our own spirits. And then how might we apply that to um, Israel today? Any, any takers on that? Uh, Bill Greenberg, please. I would uh, just uh, differentiate between depression and demoralization. Uh, okay. Uh, and, you know, depression, the clinical syndrome, often requires a medical intervention. But if we're talking about what uh, I, I would say that your description of yourself is more demoralized and, and distressed. Right. And uh, I think that we all know that looking at others and helping others is one of the uh, best uh, cures for that. And we know that, you know, the studies of, the, you know, the so-called happiness studies uh, always uh, have really uh, demonstrated it uh, in, a, in, a in a powerful way. Uh, so I, I think there's really something to it. Uh, so the question is, how do uh, how do we deal with this uh, problem in Israel? Oh, I should say, you know, as a as a healthcare worker, the first months of COVID, which was you know, frightening as hell for many, my colleagues, many of my colleagues and I, in the first months, felt enlivened by it uh, because we were so actively trying to intervene. So that's a small example. Right. Uh, uh, so the question is, how can we intervene? Uh, and, uh, and I would think that serious intervention would uh, help with demoralization. Yeah, Bill, thank you for that. Right, so I, that's um, part of my read of this book and how it applies to Israel today is to figure out, I want to leave you with the question, how do I convert my demoralization? How do I convert my concern? How do I convert my alarm? You pick your noun about Israel. And how do I exercise some agency and do something for Israel? Right, so that we're not just passively worried about what's happening in Israel. Um, and by the way, I, since you know I'm with college kids and high school kids who are really struggling about Israel, this entire Ben Gavir thing is a double whammy because it's it's bad for Israel and it's toxic, 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 beyond toxic for our kids at, at Wellesley and Oberlin and any college. 
uh, who are dealing with this, right? So it's a double toxicity. And the question I want to leave, leave you with is not to just feel it and, and bemoan it and lament it and be demoralized by it. Uh, thank you, Bill, for the <laughs> helpful distinction. But how do we convert that demoralization or that noun, whatever it is, into agency where you can actually uh, do something for Israel? And, and I want to leave you with uh, the last page of the book, which is just so, and, and leave you with an image and then leave you with a question, and I would love anybody's wisdom on it. Um, uh, uh, Sean, if you could turn to page 12, and, and this is the last text we'll look at. It's the last paragraph of the book, but uh, this is years later. Uh, Cohn is now, um, I think he's in his uh, 70s when he does this concert. Uh, he's 75. He's 75. Um, when he does this concert, he was 39 when he was in the Sinai, so it's years later. And he's at a, a stadium in Israel. Cohn raised his hands and parted his fingers. He switched from English to Hebrew, not the Hebrew of Tel Aviv streets, but the archaic language of the synagogue and the diaspora, of the old man at the gate of heaven, which was the synagogue in Canada, the language of his parents, 15 words, that's the priestly blessing, Yevrech HaKadonai, et cetera. He blessed the people and left the stage. So thank you, Sean. We'll go back to full screen. So here's my question. How do we, what does that look like for us? How can we, that's the question I want to leave you with and would love your comments on. How do we bless Israel? What can I do for Israel? Any, any takers? Uh, please, uh, Joel. Uh, Joel, please. It's not a short-term uh, uh, fix. It's not just when some event happens. This is a, it's day in, day out, month in, month out, year in, year out. And um, I think uh, uh, your leadership in uh, the synagogue is part of it. <clears throat> um, the trips you make to a real Israel when you're visiting your father in love and others, uh, the mission you and Shira are going to be part of. Unless we're willing to move there, which I don't think most of the people in this call, including me, are willing to do at this point in time, that's part of what we do. And it's a it's a full country, and they're gonna like in America, you know, none of our, I, I, many on this call, I don't think, were thrilled and delighted when Trump was elected president. We we're wondering what was happening to this country. Um, this is not a good, this is not a good thing, but. Um, we all have, many of us have friends or family in Israel who are living lives of meaning and purpose. And this in a democratic country is going to happen. It's part of the price of democracy. Not easy, but again, it's not just a, because the election was Tuesday and we, we feel anxious today. It's really a, a long-term, like raising your family, the raising children isn't a one event, a two event thing a year. It's uh, day in and day out over a long period of time to try to, to hope to get the results that you're looking for. Thank you, Joel. Uh, we're gonna take one last comment from uh, hi, hi or Sheila, and then I'll close up. So, I think, um, as uh, being said, it is a long term proposition. Uh, wait, Sean, can you just mute everybody? Because we're, I was at least getting some static. Can you start uh, again, please, hi? Yeah, I'm afraid that we're going to be challenged to support Israel, uh, that our, our Congress people are going to have some trouble with that. And we're going to be called upon to express our concerns that I think the Biden administration is going to run into conflict with Netanyahu. So we're going to have some opportunities to really express what we feel and ultimately to back Israel despite our misgivings. So I, I think we need to keep that in mind. Yeah, okay. So hi, let me, let me, I, I want to mostly close with it with, uh, you know, first of all, gratitude to Sean for, for hosting so ably as always. Thank you, Sean. I want to thank all of you for reading the book and being in on this conversation. I want to leave you with, with, with a question and a thought. And the question is, what do I do? What can I do for Israel? How can I bless Israel? And I, and I don't have the answer in my own case yet, but I feel like um, a new paradigm is required. 
I feel like a new, for me, I'm just speaking for me. I'm not speaking for you. I'm just speaking for me. A new paradigm is required. Um, and I'm speaking candidly. I'm speaking candidly. This morning, you know, I, I was at my email. I couldn't sleep and really early. And I see a congratulatory uh, email that went out from the president of APAC, which is, uh, isn't it wonderful that Israel has a democracy and Israel, you know, um, had elections and it's amazing and what wonderful the Israeli people have spoken and no indication in the email from APAC that, yeah, it has democracy, but it just elected a hater and it just empowered hate. And I, I, I emailed Michelle and Aliza like six in the morning saying, these guys are freaking clueless. To me, clueless. How can you just say, yay, Israel has a democracy and actually not acknowledge the fact that the result of the democracy is that a guy with Borch Goldstein portrait is now the kingmaker of Israel? And it made me realize, so I don't have the answer, but I, I want to say this. I feel like I need some new moves. I don't know what they are, but I feel like just, just my, the, my reflex, reflexive move for the last 25 years has been just advocate, 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 advocate. And, and I think that, um, we, I don't know what the new moves are, but we need some new moves that involve, you know, more emphasis on moral education, moral conversation, um, and making sure that Jewish values are, um, are protected. And, you know, we live at you, you. I'm sure you saw this today that the FBI alert that synagogues in New Jersey are threatened. I'm sure you all saw that. I'm sure it's all on your phone that synagogues in New Jersey. Uh, there's a broad alert and, and the FBI and the guy who's the, the Mark Baker of New Jersey said uh, this is really weird. It's never come out this way and it hasn't come out this way. Um, that um that uh but but new jersey like new jersey synagogues are on high alert okay and uh we know that hate is bad and we know that hate is unacceptable so how can we elect a hater how can we elect a hater so I don't know have the answer, but I, so, so here's what I would love to invite you guys to do. I mean, number one, do not give up on Israel. We only have one Israel. And, and by the way, what happened to Israel is going to happen to America. And it's happening to pretty much every country in the world. Listen to Ezra Klein. Uh, we, we're not going to give up on our own country. Next Tuesday is going to be what it will be. Uh, we're not going to give up on Israel. So number two. Uh, we need to bless Israel, be there for Israel, and do something for Israel. I don't know what it is. Number three, um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think the best way to figure that out together is to actually go to Israel. And, you know, we have got two moves coming up. We have the Spark mission in, in, uh, in April. We have the Hartman mission in June, the end of June. Neither of these is a rah-rah land for, without a people for people without a land. Let's go to Masada and have falafel. Neither of those is that. It's both of those trips, the, the one that Mark Baker is leading in April and the one that uh, is at Hartman are going to deal exactly with these questions. And we're going to talk to Israelis. And we're going to talk to Palestinians and we're going to meet uh, we're going to meet victims of, of the low-level intifada, to use David Rosenson's uh, term. But we're going to meet with real people, and, and let's be in dialogue. You know, and, and here's the main point of this book. A non-Israeli showed up, and 50 years later, Avi and Svi still feel the love. Let's show up, and let's offer our love. Erev Tov, everyone, and Shabbat Shalom.